One summer morning in 1967, a battered American ship pulled into the port of Valletta. Six days earlier, on the 8th of June, the USS Liberty had been attacked. A torpedo had blown a huge hole in the ship's side, leaving her lower decks flooded. Everybody in the space that I worked in died, except me. Lost too was some of America's most sensitive electronic intelligence equipment, because the Liberty was a spy ship. The Liberty should not have been there. It was no enemy that tried to sink the Liberty. It was America's ally, Israel, then fighting its Arab neighbors in the Six Day War. The survivors have always said the attack was no accident. We were well known, and the attack was obviously deliberate. I consider it、uh, this cold-blooded murder of American sailors that day. Yet Israel insists it was a tragic case of mistaken identity. It's very embarrassing for for a military force like the Israeli Defense Forces. To make such a blunder, no doubt, but we admit our mistake. That does not mean that there was any intention or any conspiracy or anything of the sort. But the men of the Liberty claim there was a conspiracy, and that it's been covered up for 35 years. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. Jews today can gather at their holiest site, the Wailing Wall. It's because the Six Day War brought them control of Jerusalem's old city. It's also brought 35 years of violence, hatred, and bloodshed. Since 1967, Israel has become the dominant power in the Middle East, thanks to its alliance with the U.S. It was a turning point in our relationship with Israel. Up until that point, we had avoided being a major arms supplier to Israel. Paradoxically. Uh, the security of Israel became one of our strategic objectives, which it had never been in the past. For 35 years, the Liberty veterans have been campaigning for justice and a full inquiry into the attack on their ship. We need you because it's what keeps us going. We can't do the things we want to do without your help. We have never For many young men in mid-sixties America, joining the Navy was a good alternative to army service. It was kind of funny.、Uh, I didn't want to go. It was、uh, Vietnam. My friends were coming back in body bags, and、uh, I put it off for a month. I got a second notice, and、uh, I figured I'd better do something. And、uh, I went and enlisted in the Navy, and.、Um, Um, went into the Navy, and、uh, 13 weeks later, after boot camp, I got into the USS Liberty. Rankowski didn't yet know it, 
but the Liberty would also be on her way to war. While America was distracted by Vietnam, the Soviet Union was extending its influence in the Middle East. It backed radical governments in Syria and Egypt, whose president, Gamal Abdul Nasser, had become the Arab world's chief spokesman in its struggle with Israel. Egypt was under enormous pressure at the time, pressure by the, the Arab partners. Uh, I remember the, the Jordanians calling uh, President Nasser and telling him, you are only bragging, you are not doing anything, you are letting down your Syrian allies and things like that. And uh, they saw it as a necessity to do something to help Meanwhile, the USS Liberty had crossed the Atlantic and put in at the West African port of Abidjan. Some of the sailors were on leave and busy with their home movie cameras. The Liberty was an unarmed ship designed to listen in on electronic communications and pass intelligence on to the highest levels of the US government. There was no other ship like her. Her decks bristled with 45 antennas and below were dozens of communications analysts and translators. If it was broadcast on a radio wave, we could receive it at any frequency, low frequency, high frequency, medium frequency, very low frequency. If it was out there, we could receive it. If we were listening and we, we heard a signal and when we looked at it, we couldn't understand it, it was encrypted as well, we'd send it back to NSA and let them hit it with their computers. NSA, the National Security Agency, is America's top secret organization for handling electronic intelligence. From its headquarters outside Washington, it controlled the Liberty as she cruised slowly along the west coast of Africa. In May 67, Nasser moved thousands of Egyptian troops into the previously demilitarized Sinai Peninsula. Israel and Egypt now confronted each other head on. Though the saber rattling didn't mean war was inevitable. Then Nasser raised the stakes. He closed the Straits of Tehran, cutting off the Israeli port of Elat. Israel saw this as an act of war and began to mobilize. In fact, Hawks and the Israeli government had been waiting for a showdown with the Arabs. Both sides now prepared for war. Soon to be caught up in this was the USS Liberty. Her commander, William L. McGonagall, had been in the Navy since World War II. The crew included highly trained code breakers and radio experts, like Dave Lewis. I was the research officer on the research ship. The commanding officer drove the ship, the executive officer was his assistant, and I was in charge of the 195 security group personnel. We were sent around the world wherever there might be a hot spot to see if we could determine what was going on and if uh, the United States desired any intervention of any sort. Life aboard the USS Liberty was like no other naval life. And in the 1960s, Ships of that ilk operated independently. The commanding officer of the USS America, which was the flagship of the Sixth Fleet, didn't keep track of a ship that was sailing um, all by itself. Um, when we were off duty, when the sailors were off duty, we went up topside and sunbathed. I mean, we wore pressed, starched, creased uniforms and spit shine shoes, and our fingernails were never dirty. I mean, we were slick. McGonagall, uh, he, was, he was a terrific person. We always, on Sunday, had a cookout on the Fantel of the ship. The 
being aboard the ship was really something. It was fun, like going from Abidjan Ivory Coast all the way down to Cape Town. You're drifting along at three knots and listening 10 miles off the coast. When the Liberty pulled into Abidjan, that was a social event of the year. I got back aboard at 2 o'clock in the morning the day we left. <laughs> I was met at the gangway by Captain McGonagall, who informed me that we had orders to get underway immediately, and I was to get the rest of the troops, and we were getting underway. In a sudden change of mission, the ship was ordered to head for the Middle East. Five thousand miles away in Washington, Israel's hardline spy master, Mayor Amit, was making a secret visit to his friends in the CIA and the Pentagon. Amit's key meeting was with Robert McNamara, the U.S. Secretary of Defense. Amit wanted to know whether the Americans would back Israel if it struck the first blow. But the two men have very different memories of their encounter. Yeah, I told him, look, we don't want even one soldier of you. All what we want from you to stop the Russian coming into the, into the arena, and number two, to uh, help us after the war. So when I finished, he asked me two questions. One, how long it will take? I said one week. How many casualties? I told him less than the War of Independence. So I asked him, uh, Mr. Secretary, what do you advise to me? Can, uh, can I go home now? or stay here until things will clear up. He said, no, you go home, your place is there now. I drew the conclusion that it was a green light. Absolutely not. Because at that point, uh, President Johnson and I and Dean Rusk had fully agreed that we must keep the U.S. in a position where if Israel called on us for military assistance to turn back the attack by, by Egypt and possibly turn back an attack uh, by Egypt with the support of the Soviet Union, we had to be in a position that we could obtain the support of the American people and the Congress for applying military force in support of Israel. And we would not have that support if Israel had attacked Egypt. So our position was no don't initiate the attack. And I have no basis for believing that uh, the Israeli you spoke of received any other indication from me than that. That same night, a young NSA linguist named Alan Blue was suddenly dispatched to join the Liberty. He uh, was called in the middle of the night, around 2 o'clock in the morning, and he left the left the house he went to NSA and at noon the next day he was on a plane to Rota Spain I'd never seen him that way he was almost teary um, he clung to me like he didn't when he had uh, taken um, prior trips Alan Blue met the ship at the Spanish port of Rota by now, the crew had been told they were heading for the Gaza Strip. We knew that from the daily news that the Arab-Israeli situation was getting more and more hostile. Uh, that so far there was no war, uh, but it looked to anybody who read the newspapers that there would soon be a war. And so we were sent out there, obviously, to listen to what was going on. Early on the morning of Monday, the 5th of June, Israel went to war. Its planes pounded airfields in Sinai and the Suez Canal Zone, destroying most of Egypt's air force. These are the original shots taken by the gun cameras during the attacks on the Arab airfields. The fact is that they didn't have a clue when we came on. They were completely caught by surprise. They were having breakfast, or immediately after breakfast and coffee, and boof, up we came on nine airfields. Two in the Sinai, five in, in, in Egypt, and two in Upper Egypt. 
And then we were the second round and the third round and the fourth round. Once again, the actual aerial combat shots taken by the Israeli gun cameras. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was boosting its military presence near the war zone. It moved 20 warships into the eastern Mediterranean. In response, the Pentagon ordered the 6th Fleet to keep all aircraft and ships at least 100 miles away from the coast. But one vessel received no such message. The USS Liberty steamed on towards the Sinai coast. We were told there was no need to worry. We had asked Commander Sixth Fleet for a, a, an armed guard to go along with us, a destroyer. He sent the message back saying we were in, in international waters, flying the American ensign, there was no need for a, an armed escort. The Liberty was approaching a scene of total Israeli victory. On the third day of the war, they'd taken the West Bank. But the big prize was the capture of Jerusalem's old city. I was elated when I heard it. Jerusalem, every Jew prays, I think, every day next year in Jerusalem. That evening, the Liberty arrived at her destination off the Sinai coast. Thursday, the 8th of June, dawned fine and clear. But the war was still raging, and Israeli planes flew out from the Sinai Peninsula to check on the Liberty. Reveille was at six. Um, you got up, you showered and everything, and, and you go uh, for uh, a chow. But before that, we had heard that, like at five in the morning, or around that time, that the planes were buzzing us. The Israeli aircraft seemed to be identifying the ship as belonging to their ally, America. There were about nine different occasions that airplanes came out, and probably 12 times that were circled, 12 separate orbits of the, of the ship during the morning. Lloyd Painter relieved Ennis as officer of the deck. He too was reassured by the presence of the Israeli planes. I remember vividly looking out through the portholes, looking down on the O-1 level, and seeing all the officers sunbathing. And at the same time, we were being overflown, and I remember feeling very good and very warm inside that we were safe. They knew who we were. We were not a stranger out there that day. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. I saw them come at us. In fact, I was looking through the porthole when the jets came down at, 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 and leveled off on us at attack attitude. To my surprise, uh, there were red flashes under the wings and uh, missiles, rockets started hitting the ship. But the portholes were blown out instantly. Mine in my chest, the fellow next to me uh, got it in his face. And we, we all went down on the deck with the force of the concussion from the uh, glass. The next thing I heard down in my space was a panicky announcement on the loudspeaker 1MC. General Quarters, General Quarters, this is no drill. General Quarters, ship is under attack. And you hear ping, 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 ping. The decks above were being shredded. Attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. You'd have to know what frequencies we were going to come up on. Um, to know that, you'd have to know that we were an American ship. If you knew we were an American ship, you knew what frequencies we were going to be on because you knew what the fleet frequencies were. Duh! Hello! The attackers knew their target but they were keeping their own identity well hidden. During the attack, uh, no one saw any markings, and some of the men uh, told me later that they made a special effort to 
identify them, and they swear that there were no markings, that these airplanes were unmarked. They took out all of our transmitting antennas, and shortly thereafter deposited napalm on the deck. It appeared to me that it was the intent of the at attacker to take out all communications and keep pe all people off deck so they couldn't reestablish any sort of antennas or communication system. If it was an accident, it was the best planned accident I've ever heard of. The only reason we got the SOS out was because my crazy troops were climbing the antenna string and long wires while they were being shot at. At the end of the air attack, eight men were dead and 75 injured. But the worst was yet to come. We immediately uh, cast off our lines and rushed out. I at least didn't know why. The sea was very calm and a uh, bright day. I think it was around midday, or maybe a little before that, but around midday. Uh, and only on, on the way we were told there was uh, an um, unknown vessel uh, to the south of us or southwest uh, of us, and uh, we sped over, over in that direction. Very soon we did see a ship, a, clearly a naval vessel. The last thing I remember is the captain on the intercom system saying, stand by for a torpedo attack, starboard side. Down below the waterline, the men in the engine room got ready to die. Torpedoes coming in, it's going to open that boiler up, and you're going to die instantly. It's going to be like an atomic bomb, because that cold water, when that cold water hits that boiler, it's operating at full, uh, there's just no hope. So... All of us 19-year-olds, the best place to be is right there. You're going to get it. You're going to give it up right then and there. So torpedo attack, we waited, and they said it went by. And this went on like three different times, four different times. The torpedo is simply dropped into the water. You lose sight of it for a minute, and then you see the wake. And it was going straight for the ship, and we were sure that uh, our torpedo was the one that hit. It hit. And it lifted the ship right out of the water and put it down, and we started to list 10 degrees. Um, but it was a slow list, and it was going, going, going. And I said, my God, we're going to flip over. I was one of the fortunate ones. A temporary bulkhead wrapped itself around me, and the heat of the torpedo exploded all of the paint onto my skin. So I was black, but it was all superficial. Lost both eardrums, got my eyes burnt a little, but I survived. And almost all of the troops within 20 feet of me were killed instantly. We uh, we just went back to work and uh, prayed that uh, this thing was not going to flip over or if it was going to go down, and uh, and and it didn't. That's about it for now. The Liberty was now paralyzed, her power and steering control lost. But her desperate SOS message had been picked up by the American 6th Fleet, 500 miles away off Crete. Retaliation was ordered for the attack. On the USS America, two bombers were readied while their fighter escort was launched. Those aircraft were, were brought forward and I believe they were launched before we went into Condition November. Condition November meant that nuclear-armed A-4 bombers were to be used. Incredibly, the U.S. was about to launch a nuclear strike against Egypt, the Liberty's presumed attacker. Uh, one of them was taxied forward to Cat 1, and it, was, uh, it had a, like a shroud uh, around the underside of the fuselage, uh, and, and it had Marine guards uh, escorting the, uh, the A-4. So uh, that was a very unusual... Um, uh, experience. I've never seen anything like that. There was a flash message, as I recall, from one of the carriers that said they had launched ready aircraft. The launching of ready aircraft, you understand, that is typically nuclear armed aircraft. Cairo was about to be incinerated. The U.S. Embassy was told that an attack was coming. Richard Parker was the political consul. There was this message that they, the Navy was 
uh, preparing to retaliate against Egypt for the attack on the liberty. Uh, they thought that it was the, the, the Egyptians who attacked it. They were preparing to, uh, to attack Egypt in response. A few minutes later, Tony Hart passed a Pentagon message through to the Navy. Recall the aircraft. My, my first thought was, as well, we don't want to do mushroom clouds. Uh, the recall probably is to rearm the aircraft. About ten minutes later, the USS America and Washington were connected by voice link. The defense secretary himself came on the line. McNamara directed Com 6 Fleet to recall the aircraft, and Com 6 Fleet said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely certain, recall the aircraft. The attack on the Liberty had triggered an extraordinary response. Nuclear-armed planes had been on their way to Cairo. A nuclear strike had been minutes away and had only just been averted. But it seems McNamara was also unwilling to send aircraft directly to help the Liberty. The fleet commander asked for permission to send a rescue flight of conventionally armed aircraft. The Admiral was talking to McNamara and asking for permission to relaunch the ready aircraft, relaunch any aircraft. And McNamara said no, that no aircraft were to be launched. Uh, McNamara's the boss, you know, he doesn't have to explain why he says what he says. Dave Lewis heard from another officer about McNamara's dealings with the 6th Fleet. I'm Admiral Larry Geis, the commander of Task Force 60. He was very upset. He said, told me he knew it was going to be hushed up, and I wasn't to say anything about it, but he had to get it off his chest. That he had sent aircraft and notified Washington, obviously via the Criticom network, because it got to Bob McNamara and Lyndon Johnson, and he got, had the aircraft recalled by Robert McNamara. So he said he reconfigured a flight of aircraft with aircraft incapable of carrying nuclear weaponry, and relaunched it. He again notified Washington. Again, Robert McNamara ordered the aircraft recalled. He challenged the order, and Lyndon Johnson came on. He said he didn't give a damn if the ship sunk. He would not embarrass his allies. Robert McNamara has never fully discussed his role in the Liberty controversy. You recalled planes sent to rescue the Liberty. I am absolutely certain that is false. You didn't send a signal to the Sixth Absolutely Fleet? Absolutely not. I don't know what the hell happened, and I haven't taken time to find out. But there are all of these claims that we sent planes, the planes were going out and we turned them around, and that we intentionally allowed the Israelis to sink the Liberty. I, I know nothing about it. While the Sixth Fleet was launching and recalling its aircraft, the Liberty was still under attack by the Israeli torpedo boats. You could see these uh, machine gun bullets going through and, and uh, ricocheting off all the metal that was down there. And it actually, was some were going into the boiler. They're trying to explode the boiler, and uh, they, they knew what they were doing. We basically were dead in the water. The word came down, prepare to abandon ship. That meant prepare only, go up and get, get ready, get near the life rafts. Well, I went up first, popped the hatch, looked out for the life rafts. They were either gone or burning. And at the same moment, I looked to the stern of the ship, and I saw one of the torpedo boats methodically machine-gunning one of our life rafts that had floated back. We cut the life rafts loose because they were burning or had, had been damaged. And they floated back behind us, and he was machine-gunning the life raft. And I knew that had there been anyone in there, they certainly wouldn't be alive. It happened so fast, it didn't seem real. None of the attacks seemed real to me. I was bewildered. I couldn't understand why they would do it to us. I, I just didn't understand a thing at that point. These guys didn't die for anything. They just died. They were slaughtered for nothing. The assault was over, but the cover-up was about to begin. At 4 o'clock, the American naval attaché in Tel Aviv 
heard from the defence ministry that a ship had been attacked in error. The American embassy immediately reported back to the State Department in Washington. I was really the first one that got the word. And uh, I, my immediate reaction was it could not have been an accident. Shortly before 10 in the morning, Washington time, the news was passed on to President Johnson. He was rather inclined to agree with my view was that it had to have been uh, an intended attack. Johnson's belief that the attack was deliberate is preserved in the minutes of a White House meeting the following day. Also present was the CIA director, Richard Helms. And I know that uh, for the first 24 hours, the president was furious that uh, something like this had gone on. Whatever Johnson's inner circle thought privately, officially they accepted Israel's apologies and its explanation. Everybody seemed to be a little appalled at the Israelis, but this was not reflected in the public positions East that the collective group had uh, outside that room. And I think we were overprotective of the Israelis at that point. I think the feeling was that uh, the pressure, political pressure, would be too much, and they were just going to let it go. That and thought of maybe it would just go away. As a matter of fact, he said to me, standing in the cabinet room one day, have you looked at the New York Times? The attack on that American ship is on page 29, when it should have been on the front page. And then I guess various people got at him and so forth, and he changed his mind. But uh, or I don't think he changed his mind, he just changed his actions. President Johnson's public stance allowed Israel also to cover up the attack. Israel has always maintained that it was a series of mistakes. None of the former fighter pilots would agree to speak, but one of the torpedo boat sailors gave us his account. Uh, we were inexperienced at the time. We were uh, probably uh, a little trigger happy, and it was a war zone. Uh, no one should have been there, and anybody who is there is doing it at his own risk. Israel admits the reconnaissance planes had identified the Liberty during the morning. The Air Force notified Naval HQ in Haifa, where the ship's position was marked on a combat information map. Later that morning, Navy HQ received reports of the Sinai coast being shelled from the sea. But by this time, say the Israelis, the Liberty had been erased from their naval map. When the patrol boats went to find the source of the alleged shelling, the only ship they found there was the Liberty. Then the patrol boats misread the mystery ship's speed on their radar. They thought it was making 28 knots, so it could only be an enemy warship. The way you do it is by taking the uh, direction and distance from the radar to the, the target on the radar screen. And uh, if you do it for a short period, for just several minutes, the differences in the speed can be fantastic. Anything between uh, uh, going backwards and, and, and 30 knots forward. So that's a very normal mistake. And so the Air Force was summoned to catch the fast-moving target. Then, says Israel, the sailors made another fatal mistake, confusing the ship with the El Kuzair, an Egyptian transport vessel half the Liberty's size. It looked very similar to, to the Alcacer. There were some differences, and again, you have to remember that she, was already, she had already been fired upon by the, uh, by the airplanes. This was when word of the attack first reached the head of the Navy, who happened to be Udi Arel's father. He'd been at Haifa Harbor, out of radio contact, and had just got back to Navy HQ. Of course I was furious. The minute she was torpedoed, and it was clear to me, actually, that she, well, she couldn't have made 28 knots. And so I actually immediately ordered uh, definite identification. And then they reported that the flag was going up, was being hoisted, and uh, then his first identification was Soviet. I said, oh, my God. Come closer. I came closer and he identified her as an American ship. Whatever the ship's identity, 
the Israelis vehemently deny that they'd ever fire at life rafts in the water. I don't believe it. I never saw such a thing. Uh, there was nothing res even resembling a life raft. Uh, and, and we certainly didn't shoot at it. We are taking part of the blame, but only part of the blame. We made most of the mistakes. They made many mistakes on the spot and by the fact that the, that the, the liberty should not have been there. But the evidence points to Israel knowing the ship's identity and wanting it sunk fast. This U.S. Air Force intelligence analyst was following radio intercepts of the attack. The communications I had in my hands originated from a, an Israeli flight commander. Evidently, from, from his questioning to the ground control, it's, one can deduce that he had given, been given specific orders to attack that ship before he left the ground. And when he saw it was an American ship, he questioned those orders. And he questioned those orders to his ground control. That same conversation that, that I had in my hands specifically noted that the ground control said, proceed with the attack. And there was still doubt in the Israeli pilot's mind. And he said, no, this is American. Repeat those orders again. And he was told flat out, do attack this ship. That night was a very long night. I'm thinking at that point, I hope we don't sink. Because I knew the extent of the damage. I'd been down and taken a look at it, and I knew that we were in bad, bad shape. We had a lot of, uh, of dead folks, a lot of gravely wounded folks on that ship, including the captain, who toward the end of the, of the, of the shift, toward the end of the 15 hours, had regained consciousness and was sitting up in his chair, and, but not saying much, just sat. Help was finally on its way. Ships from the 6th Fleet were steaming towards the Liberty and would reach her the next morning. It was quite a sight uh, to see so much of a flotilla there, the carriers. I mean, we, did, we looked and we said, God, what a flotilla. Where the hell were you? Where, why didn't you come? I mean, everybody aboard the ship said the same thing. The Liberty was now heading to Malta for emergency repairs. An important visitor was helicoptered aboard. Admiral Isaac Kidd was leading a naval inquiry into the attack. His behavior surprised the sailors. I thought he was a very strange person because he took his stars off and, and walked around, tried to walk around like a, a regular guy. You know, everybody knew who he was. But I thought that was rather strange. I, I, I didn't buy into that one real easy. He took his... Uh his eagles off and he says well guys he says you just pretend that uh, I'm one of you guys now tell me uh, tell me all about it so they told what they seen in that and after a while he put his pins back on and he says uh, I don't want you guys talking about this at all to anybody your shipmates don't uh, don't be giving any interviews here uh, while we're in Malta he says anything that has to be uh, told through your uh, division officer through your captain don't be uh, talking to your family about I mean he was very specific by this time all the injured men had been taken aboard the rescue ships I remember being hauled up into that helicopter in a basket that had been wrapped tightly around me from head to toe. And the corpsman, not knowing which end was up, sat on my head all the way back. And all I could think of was what an ignominious way to die after having survived a torpedo attack. They took the wounded and the dead off and took them to the USS America, where we were then taken into their hospital area that was when the Navy and the might of the United States Navy was really with us. Up until then, it hadn't been.
an unarmed American ship had been attacked by Israeli planes and boats. Thirty-four sailors were dead, and the U.S. had done nothing to help. For the first time in 35 years, we can explain why. The theory has cast light on the tangled web of American-Israeli relations. Some people suspect the ship might have been overhearing information on Israeli operations in the Sinai. I think they intended to attack the ship. Exactly why they wanted to, they, I, I'm not sure. They may have felt we were, uh, with, that, with the liberty, we were listening in to some conversations and other things that were going on that they didn't want us to know about. And uh, they, they had been engaged in some pretty outlandish stuff in the course of the war. And I didn't think they wanted us to know all the detail of that. I don't think that we would have cared. America was not an enemy. There was nothing they could uh, in any way involve us, threaten us, concern us. No. I don't even know what were the task of the liberty. What really, what the purpose, to find out where, how the war was going on, I don't know. But there's a broader theory, that the attack was intended to be blamed on Egypt, and would therefore draw America into the war, and was carried out with the foreknowledge of certain people in Washington. The Liberty's captain had always suspected this was the case. In 1997, at Arlington Cemetery, he broke his 30-year silence. For many years, I had wanted to believe that the attack on the Liberty was pure error. It appears to me that it was not a pure case of mistaken identity. I think that it's about time that the state of Israel and the United States government provide the crew members of the Liberty and the rest of the American people the facts of what happened and why it came about that the Liberty was attacked 30 years ago today. Less than two years later, McGonagall himself would be buried at Arlington. Shortly before he died, he sent an open letter to President Clinton calling for Israel to acknowledge publicly that her armed forces had deliberately attacked the USS Liberty. Captain McGonagall was more than just a captain in the Navy. He was a friend. He was a sailor's captain. Towards the end of his life, McGonagall confided in his old friend, the chief engineer. Captain and I was, was, was real close, and um, every time I'd see him while he was in the hospital, uh, he would cry, and, and uh, he called me a few years, two or three years before he died. Uh, he was going to be in Washington for me to come up there, and I sat in a room with him, we chatted a while, and then he got started telling me that those SOBs really did us in, George. And I said, what are you talking about? McGonagall went on to say that if the liberty had been sunk with all hands, the blame would naturally fall on Egypt and her Soviet backer. We were guinea pigs to be sunk, and then we could say, Egypt... And Russia did it. That way the United States could have stepped right in and helped Israel. We found evidence that this was part of a larger plan hatched by Israeli and American intelligence to invade Egypt and overthrow Nasser, a plan codenamed Cyanide. A key figure was James Angleton, Israel's closest friend in the CIA and unique beneficiary of a memorial from Mossad. Jim Ennis first came across cyanide almost by chance. I had gone to the LBJ library asking for, you know, all Liberty documents, and this one-page paper came out of nowhere. Minutes from the 303 committee. 
The 303 Committee was a secret group that used to meet at the old executive office building, round the corner from the White House. 303 Committee was simply a device for examining covert operations of any kind and making a judgment on behalf of the president so he wouldn't be nailed with the thing if it failed. Here, in April 1967, the committee met to discuss a sensitive Defense Department project. It would involve the Liberty with a highly risky submarine operation to help Israel. Scribbled on the minutes is a note. Submarine within UAR waters. Another term for Egypt. Especially the fact that this was in the Liberty file uh, suggested that this had to do with uh, with the submarine that was near us and uh, with cyanide and all the other things. Dave Lewis had also heard about cyanide. One of his officers had told him the ship was carrying secret documents in connection with a submarine project. He said there are sealed orders in my safe for Project Cyanide that involves communication via submarine in case of war. That's all I know about it. The orders were never open. When the attack took place, there wasn't time. So I don't know what they said. What connection could this mysterious submarine have had with the Liberty? And why was it being discussed a full two months in advance of the war? The operation is still so sensitive that we could get no comment from US or Israeli intelligence. Operation Sinai. If I heard about it, if I heard so... What was it? Uh, <clears throat> I suggest we stop the interview here. Yeah. What do you say? Why you want it? Why would you not be able to speak about Operation Cyanide? It's 34 years since. <clears throat> signature and loyalty to my country. Is it very sensitive? I am built so, and I know exactly what I am able to tell you, and I know exactly where I stop. And here I stop. Operation Cyanide was a joint Israeli-American venture using submarines and other covert type uh, uh, intelligence gathering efforts uh, against the UAR. But that has a logical explanation. The explanation is the UAR uh, was uh, totally Soviet equipped. They had Soviet advisors. So the Soviet Union was our arch enemy at the time. And we were concerned in a volatile Mideast situation with the Soviet problem. We were concerned wherever the Soviets showed, uh, showed up. And, is, and they had considerable influence in the United Arab Republic. So there were these uh, uh, joint ventures with Israeli intelligence. We were strategic and tactical reconnaissance photo processing specialists. We flew probably eight missions that day. All bomb damage assessments all airports in disarray, lines of aircraft destroyed in place. From what we saw in that film, it was unchallengeable um, destruction of the enemy. This covert operation was also part of cyanide. Before the war, the team had secretly been sent to an Israeli air base in the Negev desert. The men wore unmarked uniforms and had no ID, while four American reconnaissance planes were disguised as Israeli. There was a hurry-up paint job uh, done to the aircraft to identify them as Israeli aircraft so that, that they would be in conformance with normal Israeli, uh, normal Israeli markings. No, not one single word of it is true. I don't know what, is the man, I don't know, fantasy, it's a fantasy, he's dreaming, he's making it up, nothing. Um, they can deny it now, fine. Take a look at the reconnaissance information, 
that the Israelis have that was published publicly in Time magazine, Life magazine, I think Look magazine, that was our work. The Israelis had no reconnaissance aircraft, and you can't get the detail off of gun cameras that, that was in those films. If it's true that America was secretly in the war against Egypt, this had to be kept quiet at all costs. Well, the implication would be very serious. I mean, first of all, it means that, that, that LBJ and his uh, people around him had been lying to us uh, through their teeth, uh, and that may be a minor matter for most people, but it would be important to us. Uh, but more important, it would mean a, a, uh, uh, an American uh, participation in the attack on, on uh, Egypt, a very serious thing for us to have done. And it would have, uh, you know, uh, finished our relations with the, with the Arab world for a long time to come. As it was, six Arab states broke relations with us. Whatever lies behind the attack, the human tragedy was that 34 young men were dead. Most were killed below decks, and their remains could only be removed when the Liberty finally arrived at Malta. By then, the bodies of five others had drifted out of the hole. Only when the dock was drained did the full horror of the destruction become apparent. I remember taking that photograph and I remember seeing parts of bodies in, in the cables and wiring that were jammed uh, around, the, especially in the top part. It seemed like on the overhead, a lot of parts of bodies were hanging there. It looked like a meat locker. Uh, we had to go down and start cleaning that up. One of the men killed was Alan Blue, the NSA linguist so suddenly sent abroad. His wife didn't even know he was on the USS Liberty. I was sitting in a park in uh, Washington, D.C., having my lunch about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on June 8. It was a beautiful, clear, sunny day. And um, about 15, 20 feet away from me, someone had a radio. Administration handling of the June Arab-Israeli war crisis. And I overheard this report on their radio that an American ship had been uh, attacked in the Mediterranean. And my heart sank. Even though I did not know he was on that ship, I was still very frightened. I picked up my lunch. I went inside to my office. I called um, NSA, and they said, yes, we've been looking for you. Alan Blue was later buried at Arlington National Cemetery. For the previous month, his widow had had to share her house with minders from the NSA. They told her nothing and controlled her contact with the outside world. I think they were anxious to not have um, any press um, around us at that time. No one from the NSA uh, ever contacted me to explain what happened. There were many, many people at the service. I'm not sure who they all were. In Malta, meanwhile, the Liberty men were alarmed by the way Admiral Kidd was steering the naval inquiry. He seemed to have made up his mind in advance and was ignoring crucial evidence. I testified about three major items that I had witnessed. One was the captain's condition. I also testified about the armor-piercing projectiles that had been sent through our ship. And I also testified about the uh, machine gunning of the life rafts by the Israeli torpedo boats. I testified, uh, like I said, for about two and a half, three hours. I didn't know until, I don't remember, months later, that the, much of my testimony was never recorded. McGonagall had blacked out during the attack, so the chief engineer took command of the ship. Yet the inquiry wasn't interested in what he had to say. I got so peeved off I couldn't see straight. Uh, before it broke up, I stood outside the door and wanted to go in there so that I could get my say in those minutes that were being taken. 
but he wanted to keep me out of that almost completely. The report was reviewed at the Navy's European headquarters by Merlin Starring, later the Navy's top lawyer. It didn't appear to support Kidd's conclusion that Israel had attacked in error. Well, I, I simply could not find an evidentiary basis for that conclusion. I had considerable trouble with the record in attempting to, as I read through it, uh, attempting to find the evidence, the testimony, and or other evidence that would support some of the findings or opinions or conclusions that the Court of Inquiry had, uh, had drafted and had reached. Today, even after 35 years, the Liberty incident remains so sensitive that the U.S. Navy refuses to comment on it. I think there was a, uh, a cover-out. I think there were details known from talking with some of those crew. It was pretty bad. How could my personal view be other than my American view, which was that uh, they intended to attack this ship and that no excuse that can be found for their saying that this was just a mistake? Most importantly, President Johnson like Richard Helms, would also have been getting the radio intercepts. It's like a cable or a, a telex, right, that was sent to all the intelligence agencies and to the White House at the same time because it was an American ship being attacked by a friendly power. Anything that's inimical and dangerous to the, to the, to the United States that the president has to see on a near real-time basis, he has to receive it. Did... Johnson, order a cover-up. No, that I'm aware of. But people were sworn to secrecy. The naval inquiry is regarded by many as incomplete. You ask Magnum about those questions, I'm not going to answer those. I am not saying anything about the liberty, period. In Israel, it was soon business as usual. An inquiry attended by the Navy chief, Shlomo Arel, concluded that the attack was mainly due to a series of Israeli blunders. Despite this, nobody was charged or court-martialed. They didn't find anyone guilty of uh, um, committing any, any crime or, or negligence or whatever. But this is... I don't want to... Uh, to make apologies for that, because it was outside my jurisdiction. After a month in Malta, the Liberty was patched up and ready to begin her journey home. It was pretty eerie because... Uh we had to stand watches um, different uh, times down where the torpedo had hit. We had to check for leaks, and you could smell the fuel oil, and it was so airy, you, you know, your shipmates were just down there, and you'd swear that they were talking to you. arrived uh, to fanfare, to uh, local press, and uh, Miss Norfolk, Miss Hospitality, Miss everybody. Anyway, they got us in and got us tied up, and uh, all inside was nothing but just shell of the ship. Nothing was left. One of the things that, that bothered me for years was coming home. I'd survived all that other stuff, but the coming home part and facing people who'd lost their loved ones. That was very difficult. Very, very difficult. The men had been ordered never to talk about the attack and the threat of court-martial. 
Now the Navy scattered them, and no two were posted together. Even their medals were awarded secretively. I remember receiving my, my uh, Purple Heart in the captain's office in Bremerhaven, Germany, and with the, ad, with, the, with the warning, don't ever tell anyone where you got it. Don't ever. I knew at that time that things had gone terribly wrong with, with what had happened to us. I knew something was up, and so I basically made a decision to get out of the Navy. And I, and I uh, did my, uh, finished off my obligation, resigned my commission, and left the Navy. Captain McGonagall was given America's highest award, but with little ceremony. That's the only Congressional Medal of Honor that I'm familiar with that was not presented by the President of the United States. It's normal protocol for the President to present the CMH. It was presented by the Secretary of the Navy at the Navy Yard, a little base down in southeast Washington, rather than at the White House by the President. Well, certainly, uh, I think it was a, the, the way that the, the Navy and the White House handled this was a travesty. Uh, Johnson didn't want this thing publicized. Uh, he thought it would uh, uh, harm relations with Israel and his relations with, uh, with Jews in the United States. For liberty, as you were commanding officer at that time. Thank you very much, sir. For the officers and men of liberty, I accept this presidential unit citation, and I would add my own personal appreciation for their professional devotion to duty. Every one of our citations talks about military action, occasionally mentions enemy action, but never mentions that it was the state of Israel. For a heroic achievement in connection with the unprovoked and unexpected armed attack on USS Liberty in the Eastern Mediterranean on 8th of June, 1967. A Silver Star Medal to Lieutenant George H. Golden. Three times when told to stand by for a torpedo attack. I witnessed a cover-up take place of the highest magnitude. I witnessed someone receiving the highest medal of the land, someone being promoted, someone given his choice of duty in the Navy for his silence. Nothing more, nothing less. And the, the silence paid off. The captain never stepped forward until the end of his life. And I only think what could have been if he had stepped forward in 1967. But a presidential election was coming up. Nobody in power wanted to let questions about the USS Liberty spoil relations with victorious Israel. I think it should have caused more of a problem than it did. It was, we went on in, in official re reactions to each other and we renewed our old friendships, considered we really ignored it for all practical purposes, and we shouldn't have. It was a very bad thing. If you want to win a war quickly, there will be more mistakes, unfortunately. But this, the result of those mistakes is that you have won the war in six days. So this is the price you have to pay. Unfortunately, the price in this case, one of the prices, was the liberty ship. Israel today still occupies the conquered Palestinian territories, thanks to continued U.S. support. The war of only six days has left a painful legacy of suspicion, suffering, and sorrow. Among those living with that legacy are the Liberty survivors, bitter about their own government's cover-up. Jim Ennis spent years trying to find out what had really happened. This book will be with me as long as I'm here. I've often said I'd like to have seen it go away years ago. I would have hoped that my book would have generated a congressional investigation that would have answered the remaining questions and the whole thing could have been put to rest and there would be no question about what happened and why and uh, we just put it on and we all go on to other things. Jerry Goss, 
Petty Officer. Melvin Smith, Chief Petty Officer. Carl Noah, Seaman. John Spicer, Petty Officer. Gary Blanchard, Seaman. Alan Blue, Civilian. Jerry Converse, Petty Officer. There's 34 guys that can't talk. And uh, there's 34 families that need some answers. And there's uh, the rest of the crew that needs some answers, too. I really don't have any malice against the guys who pulled the triggers because they were the guys that were given orders, do it, because if you don't do it, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. I would like to meet those guys and see what they've had to say to me. People gave the orders. They got away with murder. The BBC Four Zone returns to BBC Two next Tuesday with a profile of the influential advertising agency that included Charles Saatchi, Alan Parker and David Putnam. The man from the agency, 11.20, next week. And starting now over on BBC Four, a contender for the coveted Samuel Johnson Prize for Fiction.